Hi, I'm Larry Troca, and in this series of videos, I'd like to share with you what I've learned about saddles during my 35 years as a professional horse trainer. What I'd like to do is go over the different design elements of a saddle and show you how to evaluate them. Uh, basically, so you can choose a saddle that fits you, fits your horse, and fits your style of riding. Some of the things that I'll cover in these videos is good saddle design for specific events, you know, like reining, cutting, ramp sorting, trail riding, you know, the different elements that lend themselves to be good for a specific event. We're also gonna talk about how to determine the proper seat size for the rider, and we're going to go over how to know if the saddle tree fits your horse properly. Also gonna cover um, the the pros and cons of different saddle pads, different cinches, and we're gonna finish up with specific tips and tricks to make your saddle fit your horse better and just make him more comfortable, okay? So let's get started with the video. Now, a lot of riders aren't aware of just how much effect a uh, saddle has on their ability to ride well. Um, I'm not exaggerating when I say the vast majority of saddles actually hinders a rider's balance instead of helping it. Um, you know, especially for the performance events, you know, like reining or cutting or rant sorting or any kind of performance event where the horse has to make stops and turn over his hocks and stuff like that. Very few saddles really help a rider uh, to, to ride well. And even fewer saddles help a rider sit that stop. Um, riding in balance and being able to sit the stop are the two, two main factors that a saddle needs to do. And you know, there's just very few saddles that do that. Um, a, I'll tell you a good example of how important it is. Uh, you know, I give quite a few lessons and, and we had a lady uh, come for a lesson. She had just bought a new reining horse. And so, you know, she wanted to bring the horse over, take a lesson on him and, you know, learn how to cue him and learn how to, how to ride him right. And, you know, so she gets on the horse and I'm giving her the lesson and, you know, things just aren't going well. You know, she's, she's uh, having a hard time keeping her balance. Uh, the stops are bad, her timing's bad, she's falling forward. And, you know, so she's kind of discouraged, you know, and I go, you know, don't, don't worry about it. You know, this is just your first lesson on the horse and it'll, it'll get better. But she asked me if I would get on the horse and just kind of fix him up. You know, we kind of detuned him during the, during the lesson. I said, yeah, sure, I'll be happy to. And so I go to get on the horse, and I'll tell you, as soon as my butt settled in the saddle, I knew what her problem was, and it wasn't her. Uh, it was the saddle. Uh, I started riding it around, and I couldn't keep my balance very well in the saddle. Uh, asking the horse for the stop, I, you know, I couldn't stop the horse. Well, I had to force my body into the position to be able to sit the stop. And everything about the saddle basically just made it almost impossible for me to ride well. And so, you know, after, after schooling the horse a little bit, I said to the lady, I said, you know, your biggest problem is this saddle. You're not going to be able to do well with this saddle. You need to get a different one. And, uh, <laughs> of course, she didn't want to hear that because, you know, she just bought this saddle, this brand new saddle, same time she, she bought the new horse. And so she didn't, you know, here I am telling her she's got to get rid of it and get a different saddle. Um, but that was sure enough uh, the, the way it was. I mean, there was just no way she was going to be able to ride well in that saddle. And one thing you might keep in mind, and she brought this up, is that this was, this was a saddle specifically named by the manufacturer as a reining saddle. And it was manufactured by a company that specialized in reining saddles. So the one thing you want to keep in mind is that just because the manufacturer calls a saddle a reining saddle doesn't mean it was designed well for that event, okay? Now, if you're a trail rider, um, it's just as important to have good balance out on the trail also. You know, you don't need 
good balance just when you're doing reining maneuvers or working cattle. You really need balance, good balance all the time because if you're out on the trail, I mean, what happens if your horse spooks real quick, you know, wheels around and turns? Well, you better have good balance. And same with, you know, going up steep hills or down steep hills or jumping a log. You know, you got to have good balance. Just, it's just as important as riding a performance event. So you need to have a saddle that's going to, you know, help you stay in position, help your posture rather than hinder it. Now, one thing that I see a lot is riders riding with, with bad posture, posture that actually hurts their balance instead of helping it. So before we go farther, let me just kind of demonstrate uh, posture in the saddle that will enhance your balance and give you a more secure seat. Okay, so when I'm in the saddle, first thing I'm gonna do is get in the middle of the pocket. And if it's a well-designed saddle, it's gonna be easy to feel that sweet spot in that pocket. Like right here in this saddle, I'm in it, and this just feels really, really good. I'm gonna adjust my stirrups so that when I stand in my stirrups, I've got several inches of clearance between my pelvis and the seat of the saddle. Uh, a lot of people ride with too long of a stirrup and they have to use their tippy toes, okay? If you're having to do that, that, that makes your seat less secure. There's a reason why cutting horse riders, reining horse riders, uh, bronc riders ride a short stirrup. Shorter your stirrup, more secure your seat and your balance is. Now, sitting in the middle of the pocket, my stirrups adjusted right. I want my shoulders directly over my hips. I want my back, I don't know if you can see it with my shirt puffed out, but I want my back to be uh, not rounded, but not arched either. I want to have just a little bit of roundness to my lower back so that I'm kind of sitting on the cheeks of my butt more than riding on my thighs. I see a lot of folks arch their back and stick their butt out behind them. And they'll have this, this arch in their back and their butt out behind them and they'll have their shoulders up and they're poking their chest out. And it makes them top heavy. And boy, it's hard to maintain your balance when you're top heavy. And a lot of people do that because, you know, they've all heard, you know, sit tall in the saddle. And so they want to arch their back and put their shoulders up and sit tall in the saddle. Well. Like I say, that just makes you top heavy and it really hurts your balance. Hard to have a secure seat when you ride like that. Plus, uh, if you go to quarter horse shows and you watch equitation classes or pleasure horse classes, it's almost mandatory that you ride like that. Matter of fact, the saddles they ride in those classes kind of force you to ride like that because they want that long straight up and down look, which is great for the show ring on a, on a trained pleasure horse, but it's the pits for riding a, a performance horse or, or trying to maintain your balance on a horse that's stopping and turning and doing something. But so basically, lower back, like I say, I hope you can see it with my shirt, lower back, uh, straight, shoulders directly over my hips, sitting on the cheeks of my butt. Now, if I'm riding a horse that's really stopping hard and turning hard, I'm actually gonna get more on the cheeks of my butt, okay? Lower my center of gravity. The lower your center of gravity, the more secure your seat is, better your balance is. Okay, so the ideal uh, situation is to have a, a saddle that's designed to help you ride in balance, go with the movement of the horse, time his movements, and allow you to sit to stop. And I tell you, those saddles are few and far between. To tell you the truth, um, most saddle makers, they're not horsemen, they're, they are craftsmen. Um, so they're just not aware of the design elements the saddle needs in order to allow the rider to ride and balance and sit to stop. And, and I don't mean to put down saddle makers, you know, there's, there, there's exceptions to the rule. There's some real good ones out there. Just like I say, they are few and far between. Your average saddle manufacturer or saddle shop is just, they just don't have any idea. Uh, the saddle may look good, um, uh, but it doesn't help you ride and balance and sit to stop. Um, few people understand that, I don't know, I'd say 75% of the saddles uh, 
that are made in the United States, you know, the brands that you're familiar with, they're all made by just a couple of, of companies. Uh, they just you know, stamp a different brand name on them. So their average rider, he's never experienced what a really well-designed saddle is because he's never, he's never had anything to compare it to. He, he rides the same saddle so much, built by the same companies. They're different brand names, but they're built by the same companies. And so he thinks, well, all saddles feel that way. And that just isn't true. If, if they ever had a chance to ride a really well-designed saddle, they would really be able to tell the difference. What's interesting, uh, it wasn't that long ago I had uh, the sales manager from one of these big companies. I think this company made, I think they make like six or seven different brand names of saddles. Um, and I'm not going to name their names because that wouldn't be fair. They're not here to defend themselves. So <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm not going to, I'm not going to name their name, but, but you've heard of all their brand names. And they're advertised in magazines a lot, and you'll see them in, in all the tax stores. And they had called me and asked me if I'd endorse their new, their new, their new line of saddles. And uh, he gave me a link to their website for me to look at the saddles. And so right, right when we're on the phone, I'm looking on the computer screen, and he says, what do you think? They're pretty nice, huh? <laughs> and I say to him, I says, you know, these are exactly the kind of saddles I tell my clients not to buy. And <laughs> I mean, for five seconds, dead silence. I mean, he didn't say a word. And uh, I'm thinking, well, heck, he's going to hang up. But he eventually says, what do you mean? What's wrong with them? And so I explained to him that the seat's not right, the pocket's not right, the stirrup leathers aren't hung right. You know, the design doesn't lend itself to be able to ride well. And I also told him that, that it really wouldn't take much, it wouldn't cost them any more to get the design right. And he said, well, if we change the design, uh, would you endorse the saddles? And I said, yeah, absolutely. And so he was all excited and, and stuff, and he says, I'll get back to you. And of course, they never did. And the reason why they didn't is because you know, the next company meeting they have, the sales manager is going to say, hey, we can get more horse trainers endorsing our saddles if we just change the shape of the seat, change the hang of the stirrup leathers, change the angle of the cantle to get the design better, and we'll have a better saddle. And I guarantee you the board of directors shot the idea down because they've already got 75% of the market share. They're already making a lot of money, so they see no design no reason to change the design because they're already selling a lot of saddles. So that's why there are so many saddles on the market that you know, hinder a rider instead of help him. And I'd also like to mention the specialty saddle makers. There's a couple of companies, uh, well, more than a couple, uh, that specialize in making a saddle for a specific event. Um, there's two real popular uh, companies that make uh, saddles. They specialize in, in reining saddles. And boy, I tell you, people buy them like crazy. But unfortunately, even though they specialize in reining saddles, they don't build a reining saddle that's designed very well. Um, again, I'm not going to mention the company because that, that wouldn't be fair. But, but they are, all their saddles, the, the seat puts you up too far above the horse. Instead of being down on the horse's back, there's a lot of, there's a lot of saddle between you and the horse. You're sitting too, up, too high up off the horse. The stirrup leathers aren't hung right. The pocket's not right. Um, matter of fact, we had some folks show up here not long ago that had just purchased one of these saddles for the reining horse. And, you know, they've stopped in and, you know, said, hey, jump in this saddle, see how you like it. So, you know, I jumped on it. Uh, and I had already purchased one of those saddles a year earlier to test it, uh, so I, I kind of knew what to expect. But, you know, I told them, I said, you're not going to be able to sit to stop in this saddle. And again, they said, yeah, but this is a reining saddle. It's built by a company specializes in reining saddles. So I don't know what to tell you. You know, it can't sit to stop in it. It's, it's, pocket's not right. So, you know, they kept it for about six months and finally got rid of it <laughs> and tried a different saddle. 
But, the, you know, and there's another company, same thing. They, they sponsor a lot of big rainings. They sponsor a lot of rain cow horse events. And even though they specialize in that, you won't see any trainer riding their saddles because they're not designed right. Can't sit the stop. Uh, can't maintain your balance as good as you need to. Can't time the horse. Um, and this company will occasionally build a saddle for a trainer, a big name trainer, but I guarantee it's not the same saddle that you're gonna get. You know, they'll build one special for the trainer because they know he's gonna be way more uh, critical. So they'll build a good one for him, but the saddle that you buy out of the store or order from their website, gonna be totally different. Not gonna be able to sit the stop in it. Some people who really, really want a good saddle and hope to get one good, they'll have a custom saddle made. And there's, you know, there's custom saddle makers around, you know, uh, and again, even though it's a custom saddle, that doesn't mean that that saddle maker knows the design elements that's going to make it good, you know, for what you need. Very, very few custom saddle makers know how to put a pocket in a saddle that's going to allow you to be close to the horse, ride in balance, and sit that stop. Very, very few. To, to, most of, to most of these guys, um, a custom saddle just means you can pick the color that you want, the tooling pattern, the seat size, you know, stuff that doesn't really affect the, the performance of the saddle. Now, don't get me wrong, there are some guys that really know what they're doing. I mean, I'm not, I'm not putting down all saddle makers. There are some saddle makers that are really good, really know what they're doing, but they're few and far between. And if you can find one that really knows what he's doing, chances are he's booked for a year. You know, <laughs> can you wait a year for your saddle? Uh, you know, probably not. But anyway, I just wanted to make you aware of that so that, so that you didn't fall into that same trap that a lot of people do. You know, oh, it says raining saddle on it. It must be good for raining. Yeah, probably not. So anyway, in this series of videos, I want to educate you enough to be able to look at a saddle evaluate it and know if it's good or not good, all right? When choosing a saddle, when it comes to fitting your horse, it's even more critical. If you don't, if you don't choose a tree that fits his back well, I mean, yeah, it's gonna cause him all kinds of problems. You know, you, you risk soaring up his back or making him uncomfortable or maybe even damaging his back. So it's just critical you be able to recognize uh, what's, what is an acceptable fit for your horse and what isn't. And, you know, I know what you're thinking. I mean, <laughs> right about now you're, 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 you're thinking, Larry, why don't you just come out and tell us a good brand name of saddle that's designed well, that's going to fit good, and I'll just go out and buy it, and I don't have to go through all this. <laughs> and here's the reason why. I don't know when you're going to be watching this video. Naming a saddle shop right now that makes a good saddle, by the time you watch this video, that saddle shop might not be making a good saddles anymore. You know, a saddle shop can go from good to bad overnight. Um, I've just seen it over and over again. I've, I've recommended saddle shops before, and this month they're making great saddles, and four months later, I'm, I'm looking at the saddles going, oh, Jesus, they're not, they're, they're bad. Um, what happens is a saddle shop can be really good and their best saddle maker quits and they hire another one and he's not as good. So, you know, saddles aren't going to be as good. Or some shops will have four to six saddle makers. Maybe one or two of them are really good and the rest of them are bad. Well, who's going to make your saddle? <laughs> the guy that's good or the guy that's bad, you know, you, you, you don't know. Uh, and I'll tell you what's happening more and more. Uh, even with the best saddle shops, most saddle shops now are farming out their saddles to third-party private label uh, uh, manufacturers, or I should say saddle shops. And, uh, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Some of these saddle shops, are, are third-party saddle shops, are really good. But... A lot of people are going to, to prestigious saddle shops that have been around for a long time that have a great reputation and ordering a saddle 
and they just farm it out to somebody else. So, I mean, you don't know what you're going to get. Um, uh, matter of fact, a, a client of mine ordered a saddle from the most prestigious saddle shop in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, a few years ago. And, you know, it takes several months to get the saddle. She gets it. We put it on a horse. And I notice the back of the saddle is tilted up. And I stand back there and I see the left bar is like almost two inches higher than the right, right hand bar. So, you know, the tree was warped or it just wasn't built right. But I mean, totally unacceptable. And she paid 6,000 bucks for this saddle. So she calls them, wants to send it back. They don't want to take it back. Uh, you know, so I get on the phone with them and say, hey, you know, you got to take it back. So we send it back to them. A few months later, we get the next saddle. This one, the rigging is all messed up. Uh, bulging out in the wrong position. I mean, right underneath your knees, rubbing your knees raw, you couldn't ride it. So again, I call them up and say, why is this happening? You know, this, this is no good. So anyway, we send it back again, and the third one we get was finally a good one. But what I discovered was they, were, they weren't even making these saddles. They were just farming them out to a third-party private label company that wasn't producing them as good as they needed to. So anyway, just wanted to make you aware of that. Okay, next I want to go through the design elements of what makes a good saddle. What, what what design elements that's going to allow you to ride in balance, sit the stop, be comfortable in the saddle. And the one thing that I want to um, really point out is that your saddle should be designed so that it's easy for you to assume the correct position. You don't want to have to fight or force your body into the correct position to be able to ride in balance and sit the stop. The saddle should just make it easy for you to do that, okay? So, we'll just, we'll just use this saddle, beans this right here. Um, I have several different types of saddles lined up here. Uh, this particular one is, is a cutting saddle. Uh, we have a ranch versatility saddle, uh, or some people call it a ranch cutter. We have a reining saddle that's also good for rain cow horse, and we have a barrel saddle. On this saddle here, and I'm going to go through the design elements of each one, but right now I just want to go through the design elements that are common to any good saddle that's going to allow you to ride in balance and sit to stop. So right here we have the swells, the seat, the pocket, the cannel, skirts, seat jockey, fenders, and stirrup leathers behind, uh, underneath the, the fenders. And we have the horn. The most important element, in my opinion, is the pocket. And if the camera can come in a little bit close here, it doesn't have to be real close, but just enough where you can really see this pocket. My hand is on the lowest part right here. The pocket is the lowest part of the seat. And the lowest part of the seat should be two-thirds to three-quarters of the way back from the swells. Here's the swells. The pocket should be two-thirds to three-quarters of the way back in the seat. Okay? So here's the top of the cannel. And so you see this one is probably, we're probably about two-thirds of the way back. And what's important about this, about this, pocket is that it's down close to the horse's back. It's not two, three inches up above the horse's back. And it takes a saddle maker that really knows what he's doing to get this pocket right down on the horse's back. Now, the other thing that's really important for a comfort issue is that across the plane of this pocket, it needs to be fairly flat. So if I'm, let's say I'm looking at the front of the saddle like this, looking at the, at the pocket uh, where, you're, where I'm going to sit. I don't want that pocket rounded like a barrel. Like a lot of saddle makers think that because the horse is round, that the, that the pocket, the seat should be round to match that horse, like you're sitting on a barrel. And I tell you what, you talk about an uncomfortable seat. That thing needs to be level. 
There's a reason why chairs are flat. It's because you want, you want a nice surface area, a large surface area for your, your, your seat bones and the cheeks of your butt. So it's important that that's flat. The other thing that is important is here's the lowest part of the pocket. And we have the rise here and we have some rise behind the pocket. And this rise behind the pocket is what keeps you centered in the saddle and off the cantle. If the pocket forces you against the cantle, you're going to have the cantle launching you every stride that horse lopes. And you're not going to be able to sit to stop either. Um, so, so the pocket needs to be, like I say, in a good position, about two thirds to three quarters, three quarters of the way back. There needs to be a little bit of rise behind the pocket that goes up into the cantle. There needs to be a little bit of rise in front of the pocket that goes up towards the swell. Now, it, there don't have to be a lot of rise. This saddle has quite a bit of rise. It doesn't have to have that much, but it needs to have some. Now, let's talk about the difference in pockets because some saddles have a short pocket. Some saddles have a long pocket. And the short pocket just means that this rise in front of the pocket starts pretty quickly, like this one does. Some saddles, the pocket is a lot longer and the rise starts farther ahead. And it's not a big difference, but it gives a different feel to the seat, okay? Now, the other, the other important um, uh, element of the saddle is the angle of the cannel. If this cannel, I don't know if, if, the, if the camera can kind of come in and, and see it, but the angle of this cantle is tilted back quite a bit. And that's what allows you to sit that stop. That's what keeps the cantle from hitting you in the back or hitting you in the back of the pelvis. If the cantle's too steep, like again, again it's going to be launching you uh, uh, forward. You're not going to be able to tuck your butt and lower your center of gravity to sit that stop. And it's going to affect you on just about any kind of performance horse, really. Um, the other thing I, wanna, I want you to draw, draw your attention to is the leg path. So here we've got the, the, the pocket, and now we've got this path that goes from the seat down the, the fenders and to the stirrups. That has to be shaped right. A lot of saddles, that's not shaped right. If you ride a saddle that's not comfortable, that's part of it. You know, the, the leg path is not right. Um, pretty darn important. And this measurement between the edge of the cantle and the edge of the, the back edge of the swells, that's basically the measurement for the leg path. And that can vary. It can be longer or it can be shorter. But the main thing that you got to be careful of is that there's a nice, almost kind of like a groove from the seat down to the stirrup leather. Very important. Now, the stirrup leathers themselves need to hang pretty far forward. You see these stirrup leathers are hung, I don't know, probably one and a half, two inches behind the, the swells. And that is critical if you want to have a secure seat, be able to ride and balance, sit that stop, um, or a horse spooks, or flies backwards. The hang of these stirrup leathers are just critical. If they're hung too far back, uh, you're not going to have as secure a seat and um, lose your balance a lot quicker. Now, uh, the other element that I want to talk about is, I don't know if the camera can come in close, but you notice the leather on this, on this fender is not very thick. I mean, it's not paper thin either, but, but you don't want thick, heavy leather between you and your horse. You know, it needs to be just thick enough where it's going to last for 20, 30 years, but you don't want that, that quarter inch thick leather uh, where you can't feel your horse, where you can't use your leg aids. And plus it makes the saddle too heavy. Nice, you know, nice thin to medium uh, thickness leather, you know, makes the saddle, you know, fairly light. The swells of the saddle, 
um, vary from event to event. We'll go over that a little bit later. Um, another thing I want to mention um, besides the thickness of the leather is how the leather is tanned. There's different processes for tanning, and some of them are going to produce supple leather, you know, soft and supple, and others are going to produce leather that's more stiff and more firm. It, you know, it, it, it ver really varies. Some tanning processes take a long time, and that leather's more expensive. Other tanning processes don't take very long, and so that leather is cheaper. Um, and I wouldn't worry that much about it. Uh, I'm kind of partial to vegetable tanned leather. Um, and that's what this is on these saddles. This is vegetable tanned. It takes very little break in time. Um, you ride this saddle five times and it's broke in. Uh, I, I really, and I like that. I like that. The one thing you want to watch out for, and this is, happens a lot, uh, you don't want a saddle that, that is made of belly leather. Uh, there's a popular saddle company um, where they call their leather, um, oh, I forget what they call it. Uh, but anyway, it, it kind of, it's, it's, it has a lot of wrinkles in it. And <laughs> if you see leather with, with wrinkles in it, that's belly leather. And that is probably the poorest quality leather that you can get. Now, is it going to wear out? in a year or two? No, it's still going to last quite a while, but it's just not as good as, as good solid leather. Like you can see the leather on these saddles. Uh, it's, it's firm, but supple, and it's very smooth, and this was cut from the prime part of the hide, and it's pretty easy to spot that. All right, now I'd like to go through uh, saddles that were designed for different events and point out the design elements that make that saddle appropriate for that specific event. Because, you know, a lot of folks, you know, they want to know, you know, why is a reining saddle called a reining saddle? Why is a cutting saddle called a cutting saddle? You know, why is a barrel racing saddle called a barrel racing saddle? You know, there's just different, different design elements that make it more suitable for those events. And we'll just go through that right now. We're going to go through it pretty quick. Uh, I don't want to make this video, you know, too darn long. But, uh, I tell you what. Let's start. Let's start with the ranch versatility uh, saddle, or some people call it a ranch cutter. This is probably the most um, versatile. That's why it's called a ranch versatility saddle. This is probably the most versatile design. Uh, you can do a lot of different things in it, and what makes it so good is that it has a good pocket. You see the angle of the, the cantle? You're going to be able to sit the stop in this saddle. Um, you can work cattle in it. You can cut cattle in it. You're going to be able to rein in this saddle. The stirrup leathers are hung nice and forward, and they're the right thickness. They're hung in the right position. The swells is kind of a medium swell. Um, it's just a good design. You can do a lot of different things. Now, it also has a little bit stronger tree right through here that allows you to do some roping in it. Because in the ranch versatility class, you've got to cut cattle, you got to do a reining pattern, um, you've got to, to um, uh, ro you know, stop a steer, rope a steer, stop a steer. So you got to have a saddle that's going to allow you to do all those events. And the ranch versatility, ranch cutter, will allow you to do just about anything. This is just a good, this is just a, a good design for just about anything you want to do. And, and I tell you what, if I was going to go ranch sorting um, or team pinning or something like that, this would probably be uh, my saddle also. Uh, I really like it. Right here, we've got a cutting saddle. Now, to tell you the truth, this cutting saddle um, isn't that much different than the ranch versatility saddle. The difference is the cutting saddle has a little bit thinner bars, 
to get you a little bit closer to the horse, get your center of gravity a little bit lower, because nothing stops as hard and turns as hard as a cutting horse. So you really need to have that low center of gravity. You need to be close to your horse. And that's what this saddle is designed to do. Pocket is right in the right spot. Now, the difference is basically the horn. The ranch versatility horn, uh, it's a little stouter. It's a little, has a little larger horn cap, so you can dally to it. The cutting saddle is a little smaller so that it fits your hand good. Because most people show a cutting horse uh, with their hand on the horn. And the horn is designed to push on, not to pull on. So you want to you be able to just rest your hand comfortably around that horn. And again, stirrup leather is hung farther forward. Um, it's, it's just an excellent design. Um, now right here, we've got a reining saddle. Also can be used for the rain cow horse event. Now look at the difference here. You notice these swells are lower than the cutting saddle and the, rain cow, and the uh, ranch versatility saddle. These saddles have front ends, the swells are a little bit higher. The reining rain cow horse saddle, the swells are a little bit lower. And the reason for that is to just, you know, make sure it doesn't get in the way of your rain hand when you're, when you're running in the raining pattern. You know, you darn sure don't want to be obstructed. And there's not that much difference. I, actually, out here on the West Coast, a lot of people show their reining horses in a cutting saddle. But um, this saddle has what's called the rainer rise. You'll see the 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 part that rises up in front of the pocket goes pretty far up the swells. Um, let me just turn it so the camera can see that. You see how, how far the, the rise comes up the swells here? And the reason for that is that will give the rider more stability in a really rapid spin. Um, riding this saddle, in a fast, hard spin, uh, I don't know, pretty effortless, really. This extra rise here just gives you that much more stability. Uh, the pocket is pretty much the same as, as the other two saddles. Um, the cantle, pretty much the same. The horn is a little shorter, again, to you know make sure it's not in the way of your rain hand. So this, this horn is about a half inch shorter than the cutting horn and it's a little stouter. If you wanted to, you could do some light roping in this saddle. Um, stirrup leathers hung far forward. Um, and that's about the difference in it. Next we're gonna, we're gonna look at a barrel racing saddle. Now, this isn't your typical barrel racing saddle and I'll show you the difference in a second. But this saddle has a really nice pocket. It actually has the same seat as the rain, the, I mean the uh, ranch versatility saddle. We've got the pocket down close to the horse, a little bit of rise behind the pocket, a little bit of rise in front of the pocket. The cantle is higher. You notice that the, the, this cantle is four inches cantle on those other saddles are three inches and the angle is a little bit steeper not a lot steeper if you have it too steep when you need to sit down as you approach the barrel and you're going at the barrel full speed and it's time for your horse to slow down and rate to be able to make the turn you need to be able to sit and lower your center of gravity so this barrel saddle has a little more angle to the to the cantle than most of them which I like uh, the front end and the horn uh, small horn, the front end is the perfect height. Um, you could actually, to tell you the truth, you could actually cut cattle in this, in this barrel saddle. Uh, syrup leathers are hung far forward in the right spot. Uh, skirts are cut down to make it really light. Bars are a little thinner, kind of like on the cutting saddle. I mean, this saddle is like, uh, really light. So if I, matter of fact, um, the seat in this is so good that if I wanted a good all around saddle that I could trail ride in, that I could work cattle in, that I could do reining in, um, 
and then barrel race in, this would probably be it. Um, most barrel saddles, you really can't do anything else because they don't have a pocket and the cantle is too steep. You can't sit down in it. But this one, this one's kind of the exception to the rule. The one thing I want to point out, a lot of barrel saddles, and you see this saddle, the seat and the jockeys are rough out, but the fenders are smooth. And the reason for that is a lot of barrel saddles, if the fenders are also rough out, has a tendency to rub your knees raw. So if I'm going to run barrels, okay, I want this rough out, but I want this smooth. And actually, I, I've actually trained a lot of barrel horses. I used to run barrels, and I wanted my saddles smooth everywhere. I didn't want any rough out. But so anyway, so that, that pretty much covers the saddles that we got here. Now let me show you the difference in a couple other saddles. Right here we have uh, a rope and saddle. It's a, it's a straight rope and saddle. Um, and you can see the design quite a bit different than the other saddles that we just went over. The swells are real low uh, because if, if you're going to rope professionally, uh, uh, the lower the swells, the less leverage there is on your horse's withers from the weight of the steer that you just roped. Um, of course, the downside to that is that if you have a horse that has any withers at all, it's going to hit the top of his withers. So you gotta, you got to watch that. The cantle is quite a bit steeper. Uh, and the reason for that is that when you're leaving the box, the horse is jumping out of the box. Um, the real steep cantle is to help keep you uh, uh, in the saddle. Uh, I don't think it's necessary, but that's the way most of them are designed. And you'll notice this saddle doesn't have a pocket. Matter of fact, it has just the opposite. If the camera can come in close here, you'll notice the, the seat of this saddle is actually convex. It actually kind of humps up uh, and then drops right into the cantle. Um, I guarantee you this is going to be pretty uncomfortable to ride. Matter of fact, you'll see this, this kind of humped type of seat in a lot of the cheaper saddles. Um, if you go online or, or look in catalogs and stuff at the, the saddles that are priced, um, uh, you know, under 2000 bucks, you'll see this and, and it's a bad deal. Don't ever buy a saddle that kind of has a con, convex type of a shape here. And if we were looking at the top of the saddle, it also has no leg path. I mean, there's no leg path. There's no, there's no channel for your leg to go from here to the stirrup leathers. Um, the stirrup leathers on most roping saddles are hung farther back than this one. These stirrup leathers are actually hung pretty far forward. I actually like that. But most roping saddles, uh, the stirrup leathers will be hung more toward the center of the seat, a few inches farther back. And unfortunately, a lot of, a lot of people uh, buy this type of saddle, not recognizing what they're buying. Um, you know, we do reining clinics here once in a while, and I'd say about half the people show up riding a rope and saddle. Well, you can't sit the stop in a rope and saddle because the cantle is usually too steep. You can't, you can't get on the cheeks of your butt to lower your center of gravity to sit that stop. The cantle prevents you from doing it. And number two, the leg path and the hang of the stirrups uh, it just makes it tough for your balance. It's tough to have a secure seat. So I sure don't recommend a roping saddle for just about anything other than roping, really. Um, and let me, let me talk about equitation saddles also, because equitation saddles, a lot of them are built a lot like uh, this saddle. Um, they are designed for the rider to ride on his thighs instead of the cheeks of his butt. And they want that because they want that, they want that nice long look in the saddle. Um, but you know, if the horse stops or turns or does anything unusual, the rider's gonna lose his balance riding that way. Now, let's talk about trail riding. To tell you the truth, any of these saddles would work well as a trail riding saddle. They all have good balance. Um, 
they're all going to fit a horse pretty darn good. I don't know if I'd want to trail ride in, in the roping saddle because the seat is so uncomfortable. But any of these other saddles, the cutting saddle, the reining saddle, rain cower saddle, or a barrel saddle that actually has a pocket like this one, excellent trail, ride, trail riding saddle. Uh, it just kind of depends on, you know, which one you like the best. This part of the video, I want to talk about um, selecting the right seat size for the rider. And um, I'll just kind of go through the basics of uh, what to look for, um, you know, how to make a good estimate on what seat size that you ride. So the first thing I do when I'm checking seat size is I put my feet in the stirrups. And I put my feet fairly far in the stirrups. And I do that because I'm used to riding performance horses. Uh, I don't want to lose my stirrups. So, you know, I don't put them on the balls of my feet. I ride with them all the way home. And I want to adjust the stirrups so that without, without going on my tippy toes, just keeping my feet level in the stirrup, I can stand up and I can get probably three to four fingers between my pelvis and the seat of the saddle. Now, if I was gonna, if I was gonna work a cutting horse or a horse that we were gonna do a lot of stops and turns, I'd actually shorten my stirrups up, have them a little shorter. Now, I'm gonna sit right in the middle of the pocket. A lot of people push their butt back against the cannel. You don't wanna do that. Because remember, if you need to sit the stop or you need to ride in balance during a circle or a lead change, if you're back against the cannel, that cannel is gonna launch you every time that horse uh, hits a stride in the lope. Each stride, back of the saddle comes up and you're gonna be doing this big move with your pelvis. You wanna be in the middle of that pocket so there's room between the, your, your back and the cannel. Now, sitting in the middle of the pocket with my stirrups adjusted correctly, my shoulders directly over my hips, I want to look at how much space I have between my thigh and the edge of the swells. And I'd like to, if the camera could come in close on this spacing. Now, you see, now some people just use, I can, I can get two fingers between, between the, the swells and my thighs, but that's not an accurate measurement because what if I've got really big fingers or really small fingers but I'm gonna go mo most of the time you're gonna have a measurement here of between one inch and even three inches depending on the measurement of the leg path there could be between one and three inches between your thighs and the swells and it still be okay now with this saddle right here I'm pretty comfortable in this you know, I'm 5'10", weigh 185 to 190, um, and this is a 17-inch saddle. And I normally ride, in most saddles, either a 16 and a half to a 17, depending on the measurement of the leg path. Now, let me step off for a second here. What's going to dictate what seat size you take is this measurement here from the edge of the cannel to the edge of the saddle. And if this is a little bit longer, you might ride a little bit smaller seat. If this is a little bit shorter, like it is in this saddle, you might ride a little bit bigger seat. The other thing that dictate, dictates the seat size is the angle of the cannel. So this is a 17 inch saddle. If this cannel, cannel was more upright, it might measure only you know, 16 and a half or 16, but nothing else has changed. The leg path is still the same. The pocket's still the same. It's just the angle of the cannel. Um, let's step over to this saddle here. Now this saddle, and we'll have the camera come in. You notice my thighs are actually touching the swells. And I'm sitting right in the middle of the pocket. And so I know this saddle's too small for me. I think this is a 15 and a half. 
Yeah, this is a 15 and a half. So if my, swell, if my thighs are right against the, the swells, I know I've got no room to move. I've got no room to sit the stop. If the seat's too small, you're not gonna be able to sit the stop. You're not gonna be able to lower your center of gravity. And the, in the barrel saddle here, same thing. And this, I believe this seat is only a 15. But just about any of these saddles, the, the way you're gonna measure it, the space between your thighs and the swells is gonna be kind of the same. Now, there's exceptions. If I'm running barrels, I might want a little bit smaller seat. Um, a little bit smaller seat might give you a little more security. It kind of depends on the rider. Myself, um, one, of the, one of the last barrel horses I trained ended up, ended up 16th at the Lazy E Barrel Fraternity. And uh, the girl borrowed my cutting saddle <laughs> and, uh, and showed him at that barrel fraternity. Matter of fact, he ended up 16th out of like 650 some horses. So, you know, and the, barrel, and the cutting saddle that she borrowed was a 16 and a half, uh, and she was smaller than me. So you don't have to have a real small barrel saddle, but some people just prefer one. So, so you can go a little bit smaller with the barrel saddle. Um, same with the rope and saddle. You might go with a little bit smaller seat on the rope and saddle, because a lot of times you're going to be standing up, kind of leaning forward to rope, and you, want, you, know, you don't want too big of a seat. You want the front part of that saddle to kind of support you a little bit. So with a rope and saddle, you might go with a little bit smaller seat. If I was going to err on any of these other saddles, my branch versatility saddle or let's say a cutting saddle or the reining saddle, if I was going to err in the size, I would err on the size of going too big than too small. Too small a seat, you're not going to be able to sit the stop. If you got the seat that's a little bit too large, no problem. Um, you can still sit the stop and if the pocket's right, the extra seat length isn't going to bother you at all. You're going to feel just as good in a seat that might be a half inch larger than what you're used to riding. You'll be fine. Now, generally speaking, most women who are between five foot two inches, five foot six inches, weigh 125 pounds or under, um, have a mid thigh measurement of 18 inches. You know, the circumference of their mid thigh. 18 inches in diameter, and hips that are 36 inches or under, those women are, are going to usually ride about a fi uh, 15 and a half inch seat, 15 inch seat right around in there. Kind of depends on the style of the saddle and the angle of the cantle, but that gives you a pretty good guideline. Most women who are, say, over 5'6", weigh more than 125 pounds, their mid-thigh measurement is 19 inches, uh, or more, and their hips are 36 inches or, or more, are probably going to ride a uh, 16 inch seat, 16 and a half inch seat. Again, kind of depends on, on the style of the saddle, the angle of the cantle, but that kind of gives you some guidelines. And, you know, it can vary. Like I say, if I was going to be running barrels, I might want a little bit smaller seat, or if I was going to be roping, I might want a little smaller seat. If I was going to be doing, uh, you know, cutting or reining or ranch versatility, I'd go with a little bit bigger seat maybe. Now Beans were talking about uh, selecting the proper seat size for the rider. There's a couple of aspects um, that I really want you to be aware of and it's really important. So I really want you to pay a lot of attention to this because it, it's critical that you're aware of this. When we're looking at seat size, one factor that you got to consider is the leg path measurement. And we measure that by going from the, the rear edge of the swells right to the corner of the cantle. And this leg path measures 11 inches. This is a 17 inch seat. We measure the seat from the back of the swells to the cantle, from here to here. 
and this one measures 17 inches. It can fluctuate a little bit depending on the thickness of the leather, but that's how you measure. So we've got, we've got a 17 inch seat and we've got 11 inch leg path measurement. This saddle is also 17 inches. Actually, actually it's a tad under 17 inches. When I measure the leg path, it measures over 12 inches, over an inch more than the other saddle. Now that saddle measures like it has a bigger seat, but it has a smaller leg path. This saddle measures smaller and it has a larger leg path. So what does that mean to the rider? It means this saddle is probably gonna feel a little bit larger than that saddle, even though the seat measures a little less, probably a quarter of an inch less. This measurement, this leg pass measurement can mean a big difference in how the seat feels. Um, if you're used to riding a saddle with a real short leg path, you can go buy another saddle that is exact same size seat, everything's the same, and it has a longer leg path, it's gonna to feel totally different. So we go to our barrel saddles here, and actually I call this a barrel saddle. It's actually, you could use it for running barrels, but this is actually the ideal trail saddle too, really all around saddle because the, the seat pocket is so good. But if we measure it, we got it 15 inches. Leg path measures about 10 inches, maybe just a tad under 10 inches. Here we have another barrel saddle. Measures 14 inches. Leg path, a little under 10 inches, exactly the same as that. This one measures uh, 14 inches. This one measures 15 inches. So a lot of barrel racers would say, I ride a 14 inch seat. Yet the pocket, the leg path, everything is the same as this 14 inch seat. What you got to keep in mind is when you're measuring seat size, you got to keep the angle of the cannel in mind. So here we have 14 inch seat. What happens if we angle this cannel back an inch? Well, now it's going to measure 15 inches, but nothing else has changed. So you can't say, I definitely ride a 14 inch seat or I definitely ride a 16 inch seat because it all stems around the angle of the cannel or the angle of the swells. Some saddles have the swells angling forward or some saddles have the cell swells straight up and down. So all that plays a factor. Um, I would say the leg path measurement is probably more important than the seat size measurement, okay? But they both, they, they both are factors, the pocket's a factor. That's just something to think about, you know, because there's nothing cut and dried about seat, seat size. These different elements are something that you have to consider. Okay, in this section of the video, I want to talk about fitting the saddle to your horse or fitting the saddle tree to your horse. We're going to do several examples here. I'm going to show you the ideal. I'm going to show you the bad, the good, and the in-between. And this is pretty important because I've seen so many horses' backs injured because the rider wasn't aware that the saddle uh, didn't fit right. Now, you're never going to, very seldom are you going to get a perfect fit. Let me just make this clear right off the bat. Every horse is different. There's so many different shapes of backs going to be tough to get a perfect fit but the idea is to get as close as possible and what we're trying to do the purpose of the saddle tree is to distribute the rider's weight over the largest area of the horse's back as possible okay the more contact the tree has with the horse's back at the right angles the more it's going to diminish 
pressure points and the more comfortable it's gonna be for the horse. It's gonna reduce the pressure per square inch is what I'm trying to say. So with that being said, I'm gonna show you some things to look for. Now we're gonna use a bare tree here for, for a little while, then we're gonna to go to a regular saddle. I don't wanna do the whole thing with just a bare tree because when you're picking out a saddle, you can't see the bare tree. But there's certain things that I can show you better with a bare tree here. So what we have here is standard, a tree with standard quarter horse bars. Now remember, we're on a horse's bare back. When we have the saddle pad on, it's gonna raise the tree up a little bit, okay? But here's what I want you to pay attention to. And I want the, sa the camera to come in close on this. You see the distance between the horse's withers and the top of the gullet? There has to be enough clearance there where the, the tree isn't pressing down on the horse's spine. Not just in the gullet area, but anywhere along the tree. Um, and you know, I see people making that mistake all the time. I mean, we, it, actually it wasn't very long ago we had a lady that came and her, the, the saddle was right down on her horse's withers and the horse actually started bucking. And you know, I told her, I said, hey, you know, that tree is right down on his withers. It's gotta be hurting him. You know, that's the top of his backbone, you know, and that's hard wood. And uh, she just said to me, well, this is the saddle I've always ridden him with. And, <laughs> she didn't she didn't care but if you care about your horse I mean if you genuinely care about your horse you've got to do what's necessary to make him comfortable D don't torture him don't let him you know it's like it's like some horses see a saddle coming and they see it as an instrument of torture you know I hope you don't fall into that category um, so anyway here we go we've got a standard size quarter horse here performance horse She's probably 14, three hands, um, average, average weight, average back. And this standard quarter horse bar fits her pretty darn good. Um, we have the bars right here. And if you can see, the angle of the bar needs to kind of match the angle of her body. And I'm hoping the camera can pick that up. So I'm hoping the camera can see this. You see the angle of the bars right here? Angle of the body, or angle of the shoulder. They have to put pretty close, they gotta match pretty darn close. If there's too much space at the bottom of the bar, all the pressure is gonna be on the top of the bar. Okay, if the, if the, if the, if the tree, if this bottom part of the bar is angled out more, all, the only thing that's going to be making contact is the upper part of the, the bar. And that's going to cause problems. That's going to cause pressure points. By the same token, if the, if the angle of the bar is too steep, say the bottom of this bar is in more, making the angle more steep, then all the weight, all the pressure is going to be on the bottom edge of the bar and hardly any at the top. And again, it's going to cause unequal pressure and it's going to soar the horse up. Um, I'm going to try to get at a different angle to make sure. Okay. So here we go. Here's the angle of the bar. Here's the angle of the horse's body. It has to pretty close match. Okay. Pat, extra padding is not going to fix that to a certain degree. If it's way off whack, um, extra padding isn't going to help at all. The angle of the bar has to be really close to the angle of the body, almost the same degree. Now, now again, like I said, no horse, no saddle is going to fit perfect. If it's a little bit off, your saddle pad will take up some of it. Okay, but anyway, I th I'm hoping you can see that. Now, let me uh, turn the horse around. We'll get the side without the mane. Okay. So, the position of the saddle. You don't want it up, too far up on the shoulder blades. Okay, like right here I got the saddle, the tree's too far forward, and I don't want it too far back where it's, it's, it's back on her loins. And you notice, 
If I just wiggle this tree, it finds the correct spot on the horse. It's going to find the spot where it feels the best to the horse, where it fits the horse's shape the best. Now, here's the one thing I want to make clear. Not only does the gullet have to clear the horse, the ground seat has to clear the horse. Right back here, and I'm, I'm hoping that, let me turn her so the camera can get it. So we've got the beginning of the ground seat right here. This has to clear the horse also. If you can't stick your fingers underneath there, again, that's going to be sitting right down on the horse's spine. So all along this saddle, none of it can be touching the top of the horse's spine. It's got to be clearance there. Okay, so now just to be clear, there's some saddle makers, there's some saddle experts that say the tree has to be behind the scapula. Some horses that's possible, some horses that's going to put the tree back here too far, okay? They want to clear the, like, if I go like this, here's the back edge of this horse's shoulder blade, her scapula, right here. If I put the, like right there, if I put the tree right there, well, that's back too far on this horse. Um, so on some horses, like right there is about right. But the front edge of the bar is sitting on top of her shoulder blade, probably an inch. So that's why it's important that the front of your tree kind of has a flare out. Um, this front part needs to have a little bit of flare to it to give room for the shoulder blades to move in and out of it. And the edge has to be rounded so it's a smooth movement for the shoulder blade to move in and out from underneath that bar. Now, let me warn you, there's some tree makers, some saddle makers that talk about, okay, the front of our tree flares out and we're calling it a shoulder free tree. By shoulder free, it means they're flaring out to the extreme up front here to make extra room for the shoulder blades to move back and forth. Now, Pay attention to this because it's important. You can't reduce pressure in one place without increasing pressure somewhere else. So it's my opinion, and it's common sense really, that if you remove all the pressure from up here, you're just going to increase the pressure back here. Okay? So, so you can't go to extremes. You gotta find a happy medium. Remember, the goal of the tree is to distribute the weight as evenly as possible over the horse's back. So if you remove a bunch of pressure in one spot, you're just gonna increase it in the other. So you wanna find a happy medium. Don't go to extremes, okay? You want enough flare up front where the horse's shoulder has some clearance to go underneath it, but you don't want so much where the tree is just sitting out there in no man's land uh, not supporting any weight, okay? All right, I hope, that, I hope that's clear. In this particular tree, you want to notice how close it fits the horse. Now, it probably has a little more rock. See, there's, a, there's a curve to the bars. Some bars have a lot of curve to fit a kind of a sway back to horse, a horse with a lot of drop to his back. And some bars are real straight to fit a straight back horse. And this one's kind of in between, halfway in between. We'll kind of demonstrate. We've got a couple other horses here. I'll show you some stuff that's important. All right, I've gone ahead and put a regular saddle on this mare. And you can see the angle of the bars fits the angle of her body pretty darn good. I mean, that's, uh, that's pretty, darn, pretty darn good fit right there. Plenty of clearance in the gullet, plenty of clearance behind the gullet. Um, well, I tell you what, that fit is, that fit is almost perfect. Let me kind of turn her a little bit so you can see this side. And of course, depending on where their head or their legs are standing, it fits a little bit different. Here's the thing about, about saddle fit. 
You gotta keep in mind that the horse's back is in motion uh, all the time. They're stepping all the time, they're moving all the time. So trying to get a fit static is gonna be different than the reality of the horse moving all the time, okay? It's gonna fluctuate. But overall, if I was picking a saddle, yeah, see that angle? That angle's pretty darn right. You don't want it too steep, you don't want it flared out too much, and there's just a much enough flare to give shoulder clearance for her scapula moving in and out. Pretty happy with that. And you can see how close the ground seat is to her back. And like when I was talking about in the other part of the video, having, having the pocket real close to the horse's back is really important. And you can see how close that ground seat is. Pretty darn good. This is a good example of a saddle that doesn't fit the horse. Can you see the gap at the top of the bars here? I'll kind of turn the horse a little bit more, maybe you can see it better. All right, so you see this gap right here at the top of the bars, but we got, we got plenty of contact at the bottom of the bars. So the situation we've got, the bars are at a steep angle and this horse's body as a, is at more of an angle. We don't have the bars matching the angle of the saddle. Plus, you see how high on this horse's back the saddle's sitting? It's too narrow, the gullet is too narrow, okay? This is a semi-quarter horse tree meant for a narrower horse, okay? Um, and for that type of horse, the semi-quarter horse tree fits great. Matter of fact, I should make a distinction. Most of the saddle companies, what they call their standard tree is really a semi-quarter horse bar. And what they call their wide tree is the standard quarter horse bars. So on this horse, if we were to ride this horse with this saddle, at the bottom of the bars, all the pressure is at the bottom of the bars because the, the, the upper part of the bars is away from his body, the bottom part is against his body. So he would be getting sore down here at the bottom of the bar. All the pressure's on the bottom of the bar because the angle's too steep. Um, putting extra padding on this horse is not gonna fix that problem. If the angle of the bars isn't right, putting extra padding on is just gonna make it worse, okay? Especially on a, on a saddle that's too narrow. That's like if your shoes are too small and you put on thick socks, it's not gonna make them feel any better, it's actually gonna make them feel tighter. So padding isn't gonna fix this problem. And other than that, the shape of the bars, let me get this horse sideways here. So even though the saddle's too narrow for this horse, the curvature of the bars is about right. You notice the ground seat is still pretty close to his back and the back of the saddle fits the angle of, of his loin pretty good. So that part's pretty good, not bad. Okay, so I've switched saddles, took that saddle off that was too narrow and the angle wasn't right, put a wider saddle on. The angle is better, it's still not perfect, but it's better. If we look at the actual contact point, we can't really look at the front edge because these bars have a lot of extra flare to them. So it's, they're really not making contact up here. They don't, they don't make contact until way back here. But where it does make contact, the angle's pretty right. But the point I want to make here is even though the angle is pretty right, we've got an, kind of like an overflare, which means, yeah, it's gonna relieve some of the pressure immediately at the front part of the bar, but it's gonna increase the pressure back here an inch or two, okay? So, so that extra flare isn't really helping this horse that much. Um, the width is probably okay. It could stand to be a little bit wider. Again, this is standard quarter horse bars and uh, that other saddle was semi quarter horse bars. So we could get by with this saddle. Um, it would probably work okay. Um, looking at the curve of the bars, 
in the way it, it fits it fits the curve of his back it's pretty good ground seats still really low back of the saddle is matching the angle of, of his back back here in the loin area pretty darn good so we could we could probably get by with this saddle okay here we have a really narrow shouldered horse with high withers so the saddle I have on this horse has a semi quarter horse bar. Uh, this is the same saddle that was too narrow for the other two horses and the angle of the bar was too steep. But you can see on this horse, boy, the angle's perfect. So this semi quarter horse bar uh, would fit her really, really good. And I can't remember the exact gullet size. I think this is a six and a quarter inch gullet if I'm not mistaken. But there's plenty of clearance on the withers, plenty of clearance behind the gullet. Um, yeah, I, I'm pretty happy with that. And I'm going to show you something interesting here. And here again, you can see the angle's perfect right there. Um, if we turn her sideways, Oh, baby you can it appears like everything's fine it appears like the back part of this saddle fits pretty darn good and I think this saddle would be fine for this horse now I'm going to turn her around and show you something On this horse, look at her back. Look how sway-backed she is. Ideally, this horse needs a saddle with more curve to the bars to fit this, this extreme curve to her back. Now you can see the white marks here. And that means she was ridden with a saddle that didn't fit. Probably too narrow of a saddle. Uh, well, I shouldn't say either too narrow of a saddle and it pinched her or the bars had too much flare to them so that the bars didn't match the angle of her body. If the bars flared out too much, all the pressure would have been on the top of the bars and none on the bottom of the bars. And that's probably what happened. This mirror was probably ridden with the saddle that was actually probably had too much flare to the bars. Um, too much of an angle to the bars. And so all the pressure was on the top part. And I'm just guessing, it, it may not be that way. And what's strange is we also have a white mark back here. What that's doing back there, I'll have no idea. Unless this saddle had a cracked tree or a broken tree and was putting pressure on both spots. Hard to say, hard to say. I don't know the history of the horse. Now, Looking at this, I want to make a distinction. And if you ask tree makers or saddle makers about what's better, having a real curved tree to fit this horse or a real straight bar to fit this horse, and we have a space here, meaning the bars bridge. We've got pressure here and we got pressure here and there's a couple inches of space right here. Half the saddle makers you talk to are going to say, uh, no, that straight bar that's bridging is really going to cause a problem. And there's just as many saddle makers that, that are going to say, no, it's not going to cause a problem. And same with a straight back horse that that's, has a saddle with too much curve to it and all the pressure's right in the middle. The opinions are divided. And here's the thing. No real studies have ever been done to, de to determine is it better to have a saddle that bridges or a saddle with too much curve to it and is putting a lot of pressure in the middle of their back. No real scientific studies have been done on that. So when you hear a saddle maker or anybody express which one is better, bars too straight or bars too curved, they're only guessing. You're just getting their opinion. 
And it's been my experience and it's been my opinion from riding thousands of horses, training thousands of horses over a 35 year period in every event you can think of, reining, cutting, barrel racing, you name it. I've had saddles that did both. Some of them bridged, some of them had too much curve to the bar and put too much pressure in the, in the middle of the back. And this is what I found. It didn't seem to matter either way, honestly. It just seems like one would be conclusive over the other. I have not found that to be the case. Now, I want to I want to preference that by saying those horses were ridden for short periods of time each day, maybe an hour or two. And I would come here, come here baby. And I would sometimes alternate saddles. So is my experience conclusive? No, it's not. But it does, it does prove a point that one way or the other, a saddle that bridges or a saddle that has too much curve to the bars, neither one is going to be that detrimental to your horse as long as you take care to use the right padding, that you loosen the cinch, let it air out. Maybe you alternate saddles once in a while. Um, but in all my years, I've never found that big of a difference. Now, somebody else, somebody else, another trainer, may have found, come to a different conclusion altogether. It's hard to say. I haven't found anybody, and most of my friends are horse trainers, I haven't found anybody who has a conclusive opinion about it one way or the other. And during the, the times I've ridden a lot of horses, I've actually had some horses that their backs were extremely, uh, I don't want to say deformed, but they were, they, were, they were to the extreme sway backed or to the extreme hog back. They weren't straight back, they actually were hump back, okay? We had, I, I had one horse, um, it was a fraternity horse, and he was at two, at two years old, he was so sway backed, I mean, he was, he, his back dropped down probably two, three inches more than this mare. I mean, it was extreme. And we never had a saddle tree uh, that had enough curve to make up for that. So the, the tree always bridged. And we had that horse for like three, four years. He never got sore. Uh, we were careful. We, were, we had good padding. And like I say, we, we took care of his back. We loosened the cinch once in a while. We would alternate saddles once in a while, but he never got sore. I've also had horses that had just the opposite. Instead of a dip in their back, their back actually kind of had a hump in it. And so here's the, here's the tree kind of teeter-tottering on top of the horse's back. And I told the owner, I says, you know, this, this isn't going to work, but I'll ride him for a little while just to get him better broke for you. And here again... Uh, we had that horse for about six months. I don't know. I've never had a problem with him being sore back. And believe me, I would check uh, because I expected him to go sore. So, you know, it's just tough to say what's going to make your horse go sore and what isn't. Um, you just got to be aware. You need to palpate your horse's back every once in a while. Make sure that if you, if you, if you press on it and his muscles tighten up, you know, that tells you, you know, he might be sore. In the, in the back. You just want to monitor it. I want to address dry spots on your horse's back. And this is a biggie. I, I tell you what, I get questions about this all the time. Larry, my horse has dry spots. And I'll tell you the truth, dry spots may be a problem or they may not be a problem. It depends on the dry spot. Here's, here's what I found. Now, this mare obviously has had severe saddle fitting problems because we actually have white hair, uh, solid white hair. If that hair was just kind of 
roan colored with a little bit of white hairs mixed in, then I'd go, okay, yeah, the saddle fit, probably fit a little too tight, but it wasn't that bad. If you've got dry spots here, and the dry spots are big, and when I say big, I mean like the size of my hand, yeah, it's not ideal, but it's really not gonna cause a problem. If the dry spot is, is large, is a large area, um, yeah, it's not gonna be that big of a problem. Most horses have dry spots on any saddle. It's, it's hard to find a saddle. It, it, of all the saddles I've owned, and I'll tell you what, over the years, I, I, the other day I was, I was trying to, before we did this video, I was adding it up. I think I've spent over $150,000 on saddles. And I mean all kinds of different brands, I've custom saddles, you name it, custom trees. It's hard to get a saddle that doesn't cause dry spots. It happens once in a while, but it's, it's, it's a rarity. But as long as, like I say, as long as that dry spot, as long as it's a large spot, um, it's not that big of a deal. If it's a little tiny concentrated spot, it could be a big deal. If your saddle is wearing, is rubbing the hair off in that dry spot, you've got a real problem and you got to take care of it right away because rubbing the hair off means you're going to end up with something like this or you might even end up with something worse. You might end up with an open sore. Another way you can tell if the dry spot is a real problem. After you take the saddle off, I'd say within five minutes, if that dry spot swells up, if it, if it actually raises up above the rest of the skin an eighth of an inch or so, you've got a problem because now you've got swelling. That means that saddle fits so poorly that it's truly cutting off circulation and you need to, to address it. Now, later in this, in this series, I'm going to show you a trick how to fix that. Um, but... It's something, it's something you gotta be aware of, pay attention to it. But like I say, large area, probably don't have to worry about it that much. Small concentrated area that's rubbing the hair off, yeah, you need to take care of it immediately. A spot that swells up, you gotta take care of that immediately too, because that's gonna turn bad. So here we have a wooden saddle tree. And its purpose, is to distribute the weight over the horse's back as evenly as possible. The more you distribute the weight evenly, the less pounds per square inch of pressure you have on that horse's back. So that's the main function of the tree. But the one thing you wanna make sure is that the tree doesn't have any sharp edges. See how the front of this tree is kind of beveled. The, the, surface of the bar is almost flat, but not quite. There's a little bit of, of convex to it, a little bit of curvature to it, so that when the horse's shoulder blades are moving in and out, nothing catches on the edge of the tree. It's pretty darn important. Um, the spread of the, of the tree, the, the space between the bars is pretty darn important. And we have what's called the twist. And what the twist is, it's the, the front angle of the bar to the rear angle of the bar, okay? That gradual twist from one angle at the front to the other angle in the back. And that's important because some horses, you've ever seen those horses that, that their backbone sticks up above their muscling? You know, you better have a tree that isn't hitting the top of that backbone or you're gonna have problems. Um, a good saddle tree, this saddle tree has an indentation for the stirrup leathers. So the stirrup leathers fit in that indentation perfectly and don't rub on the horse's back. They also have an indentation at the top of the tree so it doesn't cause a bulge underneath the rider's legs. I think that's pretty darn important. And you can see this tree has a fiberglass ground seat uh, put in it and a slot cut out for the stirrup leathers and notice where that the stirrup leathers hang it's it's just about an inch and a half away from the swells that's that's excellent that's an excellent position 
good angle to the cantle. If the cantle is too steep, it'll hit the rider in the back when he tries to sit the stop. Um, you'll see some of those saddles uh, that have a real steep cantle or a real tall cantle can't sit the stop in those. And, and that all goes back to the, to the tree. This tree is fiberglass covered. Some trees are covered with rawhide. I don't prefer one over the other. Um, uh, you know, the rawhide tree may be a little stronger, but it's also gonna weigh a lot more. Uh, and I think weight, the weight of the saddle is a factor. I don't want a real heavy saddle. I want a saddle that I can lift up on the horse's back without killing myself. But anyway, so that, you know, that's the basic tree design. Um, I like the design of this tree pretty well. Um, there may be a few things that could be improved on. There could sure be some things that are a lot worse. The one thing you have to be aware of when, when a saddle, when a, when a tree company makes a saddle or a tree, they need to make that tree wide enough between the bars to fit the horse. But if the space between the bars is sometimes wide enough to fit the horse, it's too wide to be comfortable for the rider. And, and you'll get a, a rider that, that'll buy a tree to fit a real wide horse. Well, then he, he doesn't want to ride the saddle because it's too uncomfortable. It spreads, him, it spreads his legs apart too much. And so what some tree manufacturers will do to kind of cheat on that, they'll put the bars close together and then just open up the angle of the bars, put more angle in them. And so when you put it on the horse, all the pressure is at the top edge of the bar and there's no pressure on the bottom edge of the bar. So, you know, it really rubs him raw up, up top and there is nothing touching down here, but it makes it more comfortable for the rider to ride. So you need to be aware of that. You need to be aware of the space between the bars and the angle of the bars. And, and if they don't match the horse, you're going to have problems. All right, let's talk about um, another popular item uh, that's come on the scene, and that's the flexible trees. And what a flexible tree is, in theory, it flexes and moves uh, with your horse, so it's more comfortable for him and the fitting uh, is, you know, precisely isn't such a big deal. And that's fine in theory, but every flexible tree I've seen is loaded with design flaws. Um, I think I've tried them all. Maybe there's one out there that I haven't seen, um, but I'll tell you what, the, I, had, I had a saddle built on the most popular one and I tell you what, you might as well put a springboard in that saddle. Uh, every, every time that horse would lope, boy, I tell you what, that, that flexible tree would spring you right out of the saddle. And the, the ends of the tree weren't very flexible. The rubber was so hard that it was almost like a wooden tree. Um, you know, it, it just didn't work. It just didn't work. I actually got rid of the saddle right away. I didn't like it at all. And plus, you still, the flexible tree still has a solid uh, swells and solid cantle that dictate the angle of the bars. So, you know, you still had to worry about the angle of the bars, even though that the tree would flex. Yeah, it just wasn't a good design. There's another design out there right now that's being promoted heavily. And there's a couple of clinicians that are promoting that saddle that tree, I should say. And I'll tell you, if those people would see that tree bare, what it actually looks like and how it's actually designed, they wouldn't promote it. I mean, it is a piece of junk. Um, very popular, but like I say, it's being advertised heavy. There's another flexible tree on the market also. Um, major design flaws. Matter of fact, gonna hurt your horse's back. Will damage your horse's back. So if you're, gonna, if you're gonna try one of these flexible trees, you make sure you see what the tree looks like before you have a saddle built on it. Because like I say, maybe I haven't seen all of them on the market, 
but I think I have, and I haven't seen one that I'd put on my horse. All right, let's talk about saddles that have saddle trees with adjustable shims. There's some saddles on the market that um, they have like little pouches on the bottom side of the saddle where you can put shims so you can, you can, you can get a more even distribution of pressure on your horse. And in theory, you know, that's a good idea. Problem is, I haven't seen one yet that is a good design. The ones I've seen, the saddle's too high up off the horse's back, especially the seat. You're sitting, you know, you're sitting that far up off the horse's back. You want to be down on the horse's back. And on top of it, we're talking about a lot of guesswork. To get that right, to get those shims right, you, you got to have a good idea of where the pressure is in relation to the shape of that horse's back. There's guys that have purchased pressure pads that measure the amount of pressure on each part of the horse's back. You know, it has a bunch of little sensors in a saddle pad, and you put the saddle on it, cinch it up, and those little sensors uh, give a readout to a computer and show where the, the greatest amount of pressure is. If you've got a pad like that, great, you can figure it out. <laughs> but if you don't have that, it's a lot of guesswork. The chances of you getting it right, you know, probably not that good. And that brings us to a saddle without a tree, the treeless saddles. And when those first came out, it was a very famous saddle maker that came out with the first one. Um, this guy was a special, admit, was a, his specialty was making cutting saddles. He made the best seat in the world. Matter of fact, people still hunt for his saddles. Uh, unfortunately, the tree he used <laughs> was really bad. It would only fit a real straight backed horse, and you always had to use a breast collar with it. But, um, but this guy really knew how to put a seat in a saddle, just excellent. But anyway, he came out with the treeless saddles for cutting horses and reining horses. And we all gave him a try. And initially, I really liked it. Um, I liked feeling that horse uh, underneath me uh, with no tree. But the one thing I noticed, you, I mean, you had to have a mounting block to get on because you got to get on, the whole thing would, would slide over. And it goes against the idea of a distribution of weight. If you don't have a tree in a saddle, all of your weight is just on your seat bones directly, almost directly on that horse's back. There's basically just an inch of felt between you and that horse's back. There's nothing to distribute the weight, and that's what a tree is for. Now, I personally uh, didn't continue to use the treeless saddle, um, but I had friends that did. And now this is what they told me. Don't know if it's true or not, but this is what they told me. The three guys, the three trainers that continued to use the treeless saddle told me that their horses quit stopping. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. That's what they told me. And it, in a way, it, I believe them. Their top trainers had a lot of experience. They wouldn't say it for no reason. So that would be, that would be my concern. Now, I want to talk about a horse's back that, that few people are aware of, and that is the the horse that is asymmetrical meaning looking down that horse's spine this side of his body is larger than this side of his body and that is way more common than you will ever imagine um, i've owned horses where one shoulder was way more developed than the other shoulder and when you have a horse like that, it's going to be tough fitting him with the, with the saddle tree because the saddle tree is supposed to be made symmetrical. So when you have one shoulder bigger than the other, um, you know, you're going to have, you know, a tight spot on one shoulder or your saddle might sit a little cockeyed. Um, and it, and this, this asymmetrical body is usually a result of improper shoeing or nerve damage 
or um, and I tell you the biggest thing is having one foot that has an underslung heel and one foot that is that has a real high heel, kind of a club foot. Almost all those horses have one shoulder larger and higher than the other shoulder. Now it's fixable. If you've got a good shoer, you lower the heel on the club foot and you put a wedge pad on the underslung low heel and you get those feet balanced out. You get a horse chiropractor to take a look at your horse and do, do two or three adjustments on him and try to get all the vertebrae kind of headed in the right direction. We've had some here that it took six months, but we corrected the problem. After six months, they were no more, a, they weren't asymmetrical anymore. One side of the body developed enough, the other side of the body shrunk enough where they evened up and you had a normal horse. I've actually seen that happen twice. One of them I owned, another one a buddy of mine owned. But that, it's doable, but you have to be aware of it because it affects your saddle fit. All right, let's talk about, let's talk about a couple of problems with tree fit. We showed you on the other horse that had the sway back that if we had real straight bars on the tree, it would bridge that horse's back, the lowest part of her back would be, uh, would have space in it, wouldn't be making contact with the tree. And some people feel that's a bad thing, some people don't. I personally don't. Uh, I've experimented with bridge pads to fill in that gap. I have yet to find a bridge pad that stays <laughs> where it's supposed to stay. Uh, and I tried it on a bunch of horses, a bunch of different ways, and I tried a bunch of different bridge pads. I'll never buy another one. To me, it's a waste of time. And I, to tell you the truth, I haven't noticed the horses that the saddle bridges. I never had a problem with it anyway. Um, as long as the, the front of the tree fit good and the back of the tree fit good, that, was, that distributed the weight good enough where I, I, I never had a problem. Now, I'm not going to say that's going to be true in every case, but every case that I experienced, I didn't have a problem. The other thing you want to look out for well, I think we already touched on it, is the back of your saddle coming up. When you cinch up your horse, the back of the saddle comes up. That's just one of two things. Either the front of the saddle's too wide or there's too much curve to the bars. And the front of the saddle's coming down and all that curve to the bars is making the back of the saddle come up. So either you got to get a different saddle tree for that horse um, or well, you got to get a different saddle tree for that horse. Bottom line, that's it. The other problem that uh, a lot of people ask me about is that their saddle slides back all the time and they're forced to use a breast collar. Uh, the main reason why a saddle slides back is it doesn't fit the horse's back. Uh, it's real common if you have a saddle with real straight bars and the horse has a lot of curve to his back uh, and it's bridging, some saddles will just slide back down into that lowest part of the horse's back. And in a case like that, you're just forced to use a breast collar. Now, you gotta be careful that you put that saddle in the correct position and then put the breast collar on. You don't wanna have the breast collar so short that the saddle's up too far on the horse's uh, uh, scapula, on his shoulder blades. You know, position the saddle first, then put your, your breast collar on. But that's, that's usually the main reason why a saddle slip, slips back all the time. You know, the tree doesn't fit the horse that well. You know, it doesn't fit the, the curvature of his back that well. I get um, a few people asking me if they should have a custom tree made for their horse. Most of the time, vast majority of the time, I say, no, it's, it's not worth it. And here's the reason why. When you get a custom tree made, number one, you've got to find a tree maker that knows what he's doing. You've got to be able to have a way of measuring that horse's back where that measurement can be conveyed accurately to the tree maker. Not an easy task. And if you do happen to find, and there are tree makers out there that are good enough to get the job done, but 
plan on spending a lot of money, you know, 1200 bucks, 1500 bucks. And now you've got that money invested in this tree and you've just got a bare tree. Now you've got to find a custom saddle maker to put the leather on that tree. Again, to find one of these guys that knows how to put the, this, this right kind of pocket, uh, put, the, put all the elements, the leg path, the stirrup, do, do all that right, hard to find, hard to find. And when you do find these guys, you know, whether it's the tree maker or the saddle maker, they're usually booked up for a year. Plan on waiting a year to get your tree or get your saddle or whatever. And the biggest thing, the, re the biggest reason I discourage people from doing it is your horse's back is going to change. The saddle tree that, that fits your horse when he's three years old may not fit him at all when he's six. Um, the two, I've got two horses right here that I've owned for quite a, quite a while. And I'll tell you, their backs change dramatically. Um, yeah, their backs change dramatically. Now, there's some things you can do with padding, and I'll show you a couple other tricks that you can help a saddle fit better. But most of the time, I'd say getting a custom saddle tree, just it's just not worth it. Now, if you're flush, you got a lot of money, and you want to give it a shot, hey, have at it. Especially if you have a horse with a really weird back, you know, you might be forced to do it. You know, if that horse is... is you know, means a lot to you. You may be forced to get a custom tree. And since we're talking about saddle trees, let's talk about saddle tree guarantees. Because these days, it's not uncommon for uh, a tree maker or a saddle maker to say, hey, the tree's guaranteed for 10 years. The reality of it is that guarantee is worthless. Worthless. And here's why. If you break that saddle tree, all the tree maker is going to do is say, here, here's a new tree. Now you've got to take that saddle to a saddle maker, have him remove that leather, and I guarantee you the leather isn't coming off that old tree easy. He's, he's going to some of it's going to get torn up, warped, stretched. It's not, it's not like just taking the leather off this tree and just slapping it on the new tree especially on the swells, I guarantee you that saddle maker is probably going to have to make brand new swells uh, uh, for you. And, you know, there's just a lot of things that can go wrong. So you're going to have a lot of money tied up just switching trees, putting the new tree in that. And I'll tell you what, it, it takes a lot to break a, a saddle tree, number one. I've had horses flip over backwards and not be able to break the tree. I've taken saddles and tied on to, you know, heavy stock and not break the tree. I mean, I've had horses do all kinds of stuff and still not break the saddle tree. It's hard to break a saddle tree. And I'll tell you, if you've got a saddle and that tree broke, that was probably a pretty crummy saddle tree. Do you really want to go to the time of expense of taking a tree made by that same company and putting it into your new saddle, you know, I, I just wouldn't do it. If I get if I get have a saddle and I find the tree has broken, I usually just sell the saddle. Uh, tell the buyer that's, that's got a broken tree, but uh, I'm not gonna re I'm not gonna ask the manufacturer for a new tree because chances are that new tree is just as crummy as the one that broke. In this part of the video, I'd like to go over some tips and tricks that'll help you and your horse uh, just do better with your saddle, make your horse more comfortable, make things fit better. And the first thing I wanna talk about is your saddle cinches. And I've got a couple here, I'll show them to you. Now, right here, we've got a cinch that's a 22 strand and it's double stranded. You can see we've got two layers of strands. And that's the most comfortable for the horse. Those other cinches, the strands are too far apart. It, it doesn't feel good to the horse. This double strand is the way to go. And the one thing you want to pay attention to is the width of the cinch. These cinches, I think, are four and a half, five inches wide. And I'd call that a minimum 
a little bit wider would even be better. Maybe six inches would even be better. Now, let's talk about the downside to these cinches. We've got a buckle right here that when you tighten it up, the edge of this buckle rubs on the horse. And horses will develop, you know, their skin will get tougher in these areas and it usually won't cause a problem. But on some horses it will, especially young horses that their skin hasn't toughened up. And you can get little fuzzy cinch buckle guards for these cinches that eliminate that problem. And all this is a piece of leather with some sheepskin on it and it just fits over the buckle and um, that'll protect your horse. The other type of cinch is, it's, an, it's a nylon, nylon backing and it's got fleece. Um, some companies call this wool back, but I like it because you see where the buckle is and with the cinch goes past the buckle and protects the horse from the buckle. So you don't have the problem of the buckle irritating the horse, rubbing the horse like you do with the other cinches. Now here's the problem with these, this type of a cinch. It looks real wide, doesn't it? Because of all the fleece sticking out. But the reality of it is all the pressure is on this narrow piece of nylon. This nylon is only three inches wide. That, that's too narrow. It, it creates too much pressure per square inch on the horse's girth area. If this was four and a half, five inches wide, it'd, it'd be perfect. Now, this company makes a roper style cinch that's real wide down here. It, it wise, it comes down at a, at a V and it's real wide down here, which would be great if it was designed right. Trouble is, they just took a flap and sewed it on here and it doesn't distribute any of the, of the pressure. So it's, it's worthless, it doesn't do any good. So that's the downside to these cinches. What I do is I alternate. If I'm having a problem, I'll ride with this cinch one day, I'll ride with the other cinch the other, the other day. Now let me show you how a cinch goes on, on a, a saddle because a lot of people don't do it right. A lot of folks will just take, and, you, and, this, and with this keeper, this is the side that goes um, with the latigo. A lot of people put the latigo in the saddle D and then run it through the, the cinch buckle and do it like this. And they've got just two pieces of leather taking all the pressure of that horse being cinched up. I've, more than once, I've seen the tongue of the buckle rip through the leather all the way out and the saddle and the person have a big wreck and end up on the ground. So that is not the way to do it. Here's the correct way. You take the latigo, put it around the buckle. Now you go through the D of the saddle, through the buckle again, and then into the holes. And if the camera can come in close on that, now you've got four strands of leather taking the pressure off this buckle. That won't rip out. That is the right way to do it. it it's just imperative that you do it that way. The other thing that I want to just stress, if you're riding your horse for long periods of time, you need to loosen that cinch and lift the saddle every couple hours. Let circulation uh, uh, get underneath the saddle. That will help eliminate sore spots, dry spots. It's gonna help eliminate cinch sores. If I'm gonna ride a horse more than two hours, I'm always loosening the cinch, lifting the saddle, let circulation get back into his back and in his girth area. That will go a long way into pre preventing problems. As far as saddle pads, two saddle pads that I really, really like. Uh, there's this one, which is a felt pad on top. This is about three quarters of an inch of felt. And it has sheepskin on, the, on the, the side that goes against the horse. Horses love this. And boy, it, it, it holds real good. It, the, 
felt has enough cushion to it where it really feel, fills in the gaps and gives way to the pressure points real good. And this has a cut out for the withers to eliminate pressure over the withers. I really like this pad. Um, when I'll, I'll oftentimes show with this pad and just put a single ply uh, wool blanket on top of it that looks real good. And yeah, I, I love this. Um, it's not cheap, but I'll tell you what, it is worth the money. The other pad that I really like is this one here, which has a uh, kind of like a suede upper cover. And then again, it has the wool back. And these work real well also. They probably don't have as much cushion to them as the, the pad that I just showed you, but this is a good pad. I, I like this pad. Now, when you first get them, they'll slip a lot because there'll be a lot of lanolin in this wool. So you wanna hose that lanolin out of there before you use it and then it won't slip. But yeah, I like this pad. Now the other thing I'll do to uh, keep my horse's back sound and keep him comfortable is I will alternate saddles. Usually most of the horses that I have in training, I'll ride them with one saddle one day, I'll ride them with a different saddle the next day. Saddle with a different tree, uh, maybe a little different shape to the bars. And that eliminates just the same pressure points happening every day. Like I said, you're never gonna fit a horse's back perfectly. Perfectly, At least I've never been able to with just a few exceptions. So alternating saddles, it puts those pressure points in different areas. So you're not soaring up one area all the time. You know, for me, that works really good and you know, really keeps my horse's back healthy. Earlier, we talked about dry spots, and I told you I'd, I'd show you a trick that will help eliminate dry spots. Now, a dry spot is usually an area where there's too much pressure. Here's a trick that I learned uh, that was shown to me when I was a little kid, because uh, I had a, a saddle that fit my horse a little too tight. We were getting, uh, uh, starting to get dry spots, and the hair was rubbing off, going to turn into a saddle sore. So the neighbor showed me how to fix that. We took a saddle pad and right where the dry spot was, where it was had too much pressure, we just cut a hole in the pad all the way through. And so with that hole over the, over the, the saddle sore, the saddle wouldn't come in contact with the sore because we'd cut that area out. Now what I would do if I had that problem today, if I saw that I had a saddle that was causing dry spots or rub spots, I would take two half inch felt pads and I would put them together. And in the upper pad, I'd cut out the place right where the dry spot was and I'd leave the lower pad, you know, just normal the way it is. And that would eliminate the pressure on that dry spot and fix the problem. Um, you can experiment it. Some people use a couple of quarter inch thick pads. Some people use a couple of half inch pads experiment with it. Felt pads are pretty cheap. Um, or if you've just got an old saddle pad laying around, use it, cut a hole in it right where the dry spots are. It'll eliminate those dry spots. Hi, this is Larry Troca, and I hope you enjoyed this three-part video series about saddles, and hopefully the information was helpful to you. Now, if you'd like to learn even more about uh, good saddle design, or maybe you just like to find out where you can buy uh, the type of saddles that we were talking about in this video, just go to goodsaddle.com, and I think you'll find a lot of information there that's pretty darn useful. All right, thanks again for uh, watching this series, and I'll talk to you later. All right, take care. Bye-bye.